Aman wa al Salan. Welcome to Aman, an historic metropolis in which ancient times and modern life meet face to face. Here, poverty and wealth live side by side. At first sight, the city's ancient roots are not obvious. However, they date back to biblical times. As with Rome, Amman was built on seven hills. But today, the metropolis of this Hasmonean kingdom of Jordan extends across twenty. In the 1920s, Amman became the capital of Transjordan, and in 2002, it was designated as the cultural capital of Arabia. Abdoon is one of the city's modern districts. For many years, the city's former suburbs have been integrated into the megalopolis. Thus, they now cover several more hills. The slopes are crowded with modern, bright terraced houses and villas constructed of limestone. A modern infrastructure connects the residential districts with the old town at the foot of the hills. In 1927, an earthquake shook the valley, and so the city's most wealthy inhabitants vacated their traditional homes in the valley and settled in the surrounding hills. The city's speedy rise to prosperity happened relatively recently, when Amman was connected with Medina by railroad. It became a busy junction located on an ancient pilgrimage route. A modern kingdom was established during the war with Israel and the annexation of West Jordan. A number of wealthy refugees settled here. The King Abdullah Mosque is the largest, and due to its striking blue cupola, the most beautiful mosque in Amman. Although only completed in 1988, it's an important symbol of Islam. The word mosque means the place where one sets down for prayer. Traditional mosque architecture originated in the 8th century during Umayyad rule. The furnishings within the mosque are quite plain, apart from the mosaics on the ceiling, as the Quran strictly prohibits lavish illustrations and flamboyant works of art. The pulpit and prayer niches point towards Mecca. Visitors must take off their footwear, and women must cover their bodies and heads. Five times a day, the muezzin calls to the faithful from the minaret. Muslims are allowed to pray anywhere they happen to be. In around 1200 BC, Rabat Ammon was the residential city of the Ammonite. These people from East Jordan built approximately 50 fortified towers around the city. The last remaining tower, the Romjal Malfouf, is situated on the Jebel Amman. However, in reality, the towers offered little protection. The 
The troops of Israeli King David defeated the Ammonites and in subsequent years the Assyrians, Babylonians and Persians also conquered this area. The first settlement was established on the Jebel al Kala, the citadel's 837 meter high hill. Today it is strewn with ruined walls and pillars. In the Bronze Age, a fortress was built. It was later used by the Omeyyads. They constructed a 1700 meter long wall around the hill. Today, the fort's main feature is the view that it provides across the city. A marvelous vantage point indeed. It's easy to understand why those who lived here felt secure. They settled on the hill and transformed the buildings according to their various needs. The Romans built temple complexes here. The Hercules temple was dedicated to Roman Emperor Mark Aurel. Now only ruins remain. Italian archaeologists discovered the remains of a Byzantine basilica. This large excavation site indicates the dimensions of the buildings that once stood here. The Omayaren Palace at the top of the hill was the main building. It had a large audience hall, a huge courtyard and a colonnade that is now scattered with ruins. The small archaeological museum on the hill features exhibits that date back 10,000 years. Impressive objects of great historical importance. They date back to the Paleolithic era. Remarkable statues, coins and pottery of numerous epochs. Of particular note are various stone statues and heads that date back to Roman and Hellenistic times, including a number of scrolls that are believed to contain original biblical text. An incredible collection of stone and clay heads and figures, all contained within this rather modest looking museum. Numerous Iron Age sarcophagi provide an insight into how the dead were once buried. Painted and glazed plates and drinking vessels indicate the daily life of a bygone age. Here, history comes alive. The centrally located Al Hussein Mosque is the city's oldest sacred building. Heavy traffic passes close to its shining white exterior. The original mosque was built in 644 AD during the reign of Al Damar ibn Kitab, the second Islamic caliph. Trade is in the blood of the people here, thus the souks are kept well busy with shopping, rendezvous and gossip. The souks contain all manner of goods, woven fabrics and cloths, arts and crafts, spices, fruit and groceries. 
It's part of Arab culture to examine the goods closely, to pick the best and then to bargain hard about the price. In the 1920s and 30s, the city's elite had their houses built in the side streets of Rainbow Street in a special way. Jordan River design. Small flat buildings with a flower garden at the front, such as this house that was built for a British military man, and from which today arts and crafts are sold. Steep steps lead to the highest of the city's seven original hills and to the black and white facade of the Abu Dawish Mosque. Abu Dawish was the Arabian name of Turkish immigrant Hassan Mustafa Shakas, who in 1961 had this exotic looking mosque built. From this southern hill is a splendid view across both the old town and the Roman amphitheatre. A Roman forum is located in the valley at the foot of the citadel's hill. It was originally flanked with colonnades on three sides. Today, most of the original Roman city centre is buried beneath modern roads and buildings. But the ruins still highlight the dimensions of the original structures. Pompeius conquered the city in 63 BC and founded the Provincia Arabia. Next to the Forum is the Roman Odeon that was excavated in 1957 and has since been on display in all of its former glory. This small theatre dates back to the 2nd century AD when it had a roof and its shell-shaped auditorium seated 500. Music and various performances once took place here, and the view across the hills made it a wonderful setting. Roman buildings that had become commonplace since pre-Christian times were also built in Philadelphia, as the city was then called, such as the Modarag al-Roman, the great Roman amphitheatre. Theatres to entertain with plays and bloody animal fights. The auditorium was based upon Greek design and due to its superb acoustics, it continues to be used right up to the present day. The amphitheatre is built on a slope and its 44 rows of seats provide seating for around 6,000 people. It's the largest Roman amphitheatre in Jordan. The two lower circles were reserved for noblemen and military officers. The upper circle was for the common masses. The stage was built on three floors. Next to the Roman amphitheatre is the Folklore Museum. Here the young can also learn of their country's cultural history.
scenes from everyday life are on display, people at work, their furniture and attire, as well as traditional Bedouin clothing. Old weaving looms and coffee drinking vessels complete the exhibition and provide a fascinating insight into the life of the indigenous inhabitants of Jordan. Various musical instruments highlight the traditional entertainment of the city's original inhabitants. And clothing, jewellery and henna paintings complete the exhibition. Some decades ago, clothing, jewellery and eye masks identified the region, tribe and social position of each individual. In 1900, the Ottoman Sultan ordered the construction of the Hejaz Railroad. It was designed to unite the Ottoman Empire that had begun to disintegrate, as well as to transport Muslim pilgrims to Medina in the Hejaz Mountains. Around 1600 kilometers of rails were laid across the hostile desert and hundreds of meters of altitude had also to be conquered. The project was financed by Islamic money. Its construction took eight years and 5,000 soldiers also worked on it. During the First World War and the Arab Revolt, the railroad was a vital means of transport for the Turks and thus a constant target for the forces who served under Lawrence of Arabia. Around 30 kilometers northwest of Amman is Az Salt that is situated between two mountain slopes. Up until the First World War, this city, that had a good supply of water and enjoyed a good climate, was the main metropolis of Transjordan. At that time, Amman was still only a small village. The ancient Ottoman town, with its characteristic lanes and buildings, was, unlike Jordan's other cities, left unscathed by battle. Its Roman past has recently been uncovered by the discovery of various tombs. The city was then called Gadora. During the Byzantine epoch, the bishop's seat was there. In the 13th century, the Mongols destroyed the hill fortress that was once built as a defense against the Crusaders. From the 19th century, Azsalt was a city of traders who fully exploited its special location on the border of the Ottoman realm. The city reached its zenith at the end of the 19th century, when wealthy traders from Palestine settled here in fine residences. The narrow lanes of the old town still contain Ottoman buildings with small wooden balconies, alcoves, arched windows and heavy wooden doors. Azsalt is a typical Arab city with a friendly atmosphere, but the late Ottoman buildings do not attract many tourists. One of the most popular destinations in this region is the old village of Kanzaman, located 25 miles south of Amman.
Its various buildings contain stables, storage areas and residential quarters, a village of living history. The complex once belonged to the Abu Jabas, a prominent Jordanian family whose ancestors moved from Nazareth to Salt at the beginning of the 19th century. At the end of the 19th century, 200 families lived here. But Kanzaman gradually fell into ruin and eventually emerged as a museum village. In the buildings around a paved inner courtyard, arts and crafts are both created and sold. There's a large variety of souvenirs on offer here, as well as local cosmetics, available in some interesting glassware. The former stables of this ancient settlement now contain restaurants and cafes, in which a variety of excellent Arab dishes are served. Kanzaman means once upon a time, and that's the atmosphere created when tea is prepared and served here in the traditional way. It's a little like sampling a taste of the 1001 nights. Wadi Es Sir is a fertile valley just outside Amman, a popular tourist attraction. Beyond the village of Iraq al Amir is Kazir El Abd, the Palace of Slaves, with some excellent views. At the beginning of the 19th century, this building was discovered along with a nearby cave. It's believed that a palace dating back to Hellenistic times once stood here. Archaeologists estimate that in the 2nd century BC, a castle was built here by Hyrcanus, who belonged to the Jewish Tobiaden clan. Jewish historian Flavius Josephus wrote that Hyrcanus quarreled with his brothers and consequently had a white palace built on the opposite side of Jordan. The outer facades are decorated with splendid stone lions and the wall reliefs indicate a good degree of artistic skill. They resemble temple facades. The walls of the ground floor of the once two-story building were constructed with huge stones. Columns and the remains of various walls indicate the division of the numerous rooms of the White Palace. It was once badly damaged by earthquake. However, after 10 years of restoration, it was opened to the public in 1994. The largest early Stone Age settlement in the Middle East is situated in Wadi Amman, which shows the long history of this region. Excavations on a hill within the city indicate that its most ancient settlers also traded their goods here in the Bronze Age. The monarchs who have ruled over this land have been many, 
and earthquakes and fire have devastated its buildings. But a man has managed to survive and now continues to be a prosperous and vibrant metropolis.